Sam, welcome back. It's 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 been what like five months since we last talked, or something like that. It's been a minute, yeah. Um, since then, we've gotten a bunch of comments on from the last <laughs> video, just to kind of remind people, or people are coming into this new. We talked about postmodernism. The main, I think, point of that video was based off of Sam's uh, previous article that he'd written on cynical theories by uh, Pluck, Rose, and Lindsay, and how they misrepresent postmodernist scholars. A lot of things have happened since then, so we can touch on that yeah. when we get to it. Um, but the main thing I wanted to do is kind of address some of the, the feedback that we've gotten from the comments. Now, to be fair, half of them have been <laughs> dunking on us personally, right? <laughs> saying that we don't know what we're talking about and saying that, you know, how dare we address or try to criticize Don't you dare like Jordan talk Peterson. to my father like that. <laughs> On the other hand, I think the other half, they have, I think, there's been a few key people who I think have made like really reasonable arguments, right? And I think one of the ones that I wanted to kind of address, I think, to everyone here, because I think, we have an interesting mix, right? Like I, I think I am probably more critical of like Jordan Pearson and Lindsay than Bryant is. I think, but Bryant has kind of come at this from, I think a different point of view of uh, kind of coming into it, kind of, I don't know how you'd characterize it, Bryant, but I, I know that we've had these talks for like, yeah, you know, it was like mm -hmm. a decade at this point where I think Sam, you and I talked about this at the beginning of our last conversation where, you know, you said that you're of a belief that yeah the the left can go too far yeah and i think i think that's something that bryant and i have also talked about of how yeah like the so-called left can parts of it can go too far and mm -hmm. i think we usually attribute that to like the critical theoretical perspective and i think that touches on one of the main comments that we got which was that <clears throat> that ultimately we should focus on the very legitimate critiques mm -hmm. that people like Lindsay and Peterson have of the left, which is that it's not that the postmodernist scholars like Foucault that they invoke themselves are wrong, but the fact that they're invoked in order to kind of put forth these disciplines like, I guess, disciplines more in the humanities or more in like the critical disciplines like you know gender studies in ethnic the studies grievance departments. studies yeah right the grievance studies and like that is what at least some commenter said we should have focused on like mm -hmm. focusing on i guess they're they're more more faithfully at what they were critiquing although i have obviously some issues with that because i think you know Peterson and, and Lindsay have, at least to some extent, gone, gone really critical, but not very accurately against mm -hmm. people like Foucault and Derrida. Right. But I just wanted to ask both of you, like, what do you think about that in terms of that part of the left? Who even is that part of the left? And is the way that they put forth theories of power and critical theory, is that problematic? And is that something that we should focus on? Brian, you want to go first? I want to hear your thoughts first because I kind of want to think about it more. Okay. And see, gotcha. see where it goes. Cool. Uh, so my thoughts on this are there are definitely – all scholarship is always going to be a spectrum. You're always going to have people in certain disciplines who are – approaching the topic in, in an intellectually honest manner and in a, in a rigorous manner and who are always making sure to maintain critical thinking, uh, open themselves up to objections, consider possible counterexamples, counterarguments. And then you're going to have some people who aren't going to be doing that, uh, at least as much as, as they ought to be doing it. So I think that's going to probably exist in every discipline. Um, but I do think that there are, you know, it, it's, it's, it's plausible at least that, that there are sort of higher concentrations of these sorts of problems in certain more niche disciplines. It's possible. I mean, I don't know because I don't read enough of those disciplines to have like a representative sample, you know, 
But mm. uh, I mean, yeah, you can find bad scholarship in every discipline if you go looking for it. The the stuff that I find that you know, if as far as like Lindsay and um, Peterson do have valuable critiques, if they do, I find that it's of people like Robin D'Angelo, who's not exactly an academic. You know, she has a PhD in multicultural education, but as far as I know, she's never had like an academic job, like as a, you know, as a professor at a university or anything like that. You know, she's spent her career as a diversity trainer. Um, and if you're a diversity trainer getting paid to tell white people, uh, you know, how racist they are or, you know, how that they have some problematic sort of underlying psychology or assumptions that they haven't investigated, well, then you're not going to, you don't really have an incentive to like think about objections or, or counterexamples because you're not in the, you know, you don't see yourself as like engaged in a dialogue with, you know, peers, right? The, the, the people you're supposed to be training them, you're supposed to give them the knowledge. So there's actually kind of an, a, a disincentive to consider any objections, right? Because if someone objects to you and, and uh, it actually challenges you, then you sort of look like you're no longer the authority there. And then, you know, because it's, it's, a, it's, it's very different from like a, you know, a, like a philosophical dialogue or a dialectic and like, you know, like a sort of more like capitalist relationship where you're getting paid to provide the service you you have, the, you're the expert, you have the knowledge. So I mean, that that's the sort of stuff where I see it generally the worst. I mean, there, I haven't really read any like academic articles that I can think of. I mean, I, I've read some Robin D'Angelo academic articles that are definitely not good. Um, hmm. But like... The worst stuff seems to be the stuff coming out of this like sort of hybrid like academia, activism, mm -hmm. uh, sort of little niche spot. Was like people like Robin D'Angelo, also people like um, Sarah Rao, who started that uh, diversity dinner thing where she gets paid by like rich white women to go to their house and tell them how racist they are. It's just sort of like a. Mm -hmm like a kink almost so like that's you know i like i get that like let's criticize that it's uh it's bad stuff and i think it makes the left look worse because you know it's just fucking catnip for the for the right who wants to you know criticize us and make the woke look super dumb um so yeah i mean that stuff's worth criticizing i think well, i guess that's my maybe that's like my uh, that's the part maybe i don't understand is how, personally like who, who do i know what to trust and what theory to trust what academic to trust because like how you're saying um maybe this activist side of it is what's been obviously that's what's been portrayed in the main, mainstream media and that's what we're seeing most of mm -hmm. but you guys that know more of the theory and, and the real academics how do I, I guess that's the problem I have is not knowing who to trust, who to look into. Like you said, like we, I can just look up any Jordan Peterson video and because I don't really know what he's criticizing or what academics he's criticizing. Like I, I just like, that's why I have, I'm more yeah. in, inclined to believe him and to trust what he's saying. He also is just like hella good yeah. at talking. Like he's just such a good talker and he speaks so confidently. And so, you know, he'll, he'll give a presentation. There's this video of him giving a, like a presentation to university students, like as if he were giving like an academic talk um, on Foucault and mm -hmm. Derrida. And he has no idea what he's talking about. Like he, he really has no idea what he's talking about. Um, but he, he presents it very convincingly and he goes off on these sort of rambles, connects it all to Marxism, you know, starts talking right. about the Gulag archipelago, which is the stuff that he really knows, you know, and he'll, he'll like weave it all together. And it sounds convincing enough that you're not going to be necessarily inclined to go fact check it. Right. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that, no, this, this is a huge problem, 
um, generally and just like social epistemology in general. And it's something that I've been thinking about pretty much nonstop since um, I first heard it really formulated very well by um, a professor named uh, T. Nguyen, who does social epistemology. I think we were talking about him last time. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And so he he talks about the problem of echo chambers, the problem of um, uh, epistemic bubbles and echo chambers and the differences between those. But also he, he talks about um, there's there's one way he framed it of um, cognitive islands, I believe it is. So, yeah. So echo chambers as cognitive islands where uh, where you basically like or I, I might be mixing this up again, but but the, one, one of the main problems is the problem of expert recognition, right? So there are some mm. disciplines where it's easy to tell who's an expert, right? If if you're an expert shoemaker, how can I tell? Because you made a perfect shoe. It's right there, mm -hmm. right? You got, you got the product to, to prove it, right? How can I tell you're an excellent soccer player? I watched and you score a beautiful goal. Like you can't fake it, you know? But when it comes to certain disciplines or certain... Uh, fields, there are some people who are really good at faking it. And so then the crucial problem becomes how do you distinguish between a genuine expert and basically like a guru who's just sort of playing everybody. Right. And those are, I mean, I see people like James Lindsay uh, and Helen Pluckrose as gurus and, and to a large extent, Jordan Peterson, although like, I think he's much more knowledgeable about like his actual areas of expertise. You know, he's a clinical psychologist, he's practiced and all that stuff. Um, but when it comes to talking about the left or postmodernism or whatever, he's absolutely just a guru there. Uh, and I don't have a solution to the problem, <laughs> yeah. but, but like we, we, if we frame it like that, I don't know, is one step in the right direction. Right. I wonder if like, I have a, f I have a, f we have a friend, uh, Bryant and I, um, I won't name his name just cause I don't want to name drop everyone, but you know, I think he's also communicated something to us and he's probably talked a little mm -hmm. bit more about it with you, Bryant. Um, but, but the idea of like, and I think this, stuff and critiques of the far left and the parts of the left that are problematic also got couched within an attack on like masculinity, like on real masculinity yeah. and being like a man, right? Now men aren't allowed to be men. Mm. Now masculinity is just by mm. definition mm -hmm. toxic, right? I think yeah, that's, yeah. that's a part Some of it. Some people that gets say that, right, 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 yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, I guess the thing, I, I guess this, the question I have maybe for both of you is, you know, I, I've always felt like, I, maybe I'm downplaying it, but I always felt like it was a bit of an exaggeration, right? Like the, the idea that masculinity was like under attack. Yeah. At the same time, I know that I've encountered real issues or instances where, yeah, I think some people who do harbor those kind of problematic views on the left. And I think people who I've heard professors and other peers refer to as like, yeah, they're a little bit too extreme mm -hmm. in my time and my master's and even in my PhD. Um, and those people I've, I've heard them, yeah, like dunking on men and seemingly like, you know, taking out their personal aggressions. I mean, and you, you see know, this with white people judgment. too, right? People just, you know, very right. willing to, to say, ah, fucking white people, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Which <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I, like I do it too. Cause I don't, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that's a really good example. Cause like, um, like one person I've, I've like known in the past has do, used to do that a lot. Mm -hmm. Like just always say like fucking white people, <laughs> and fucking hate white people. And, um, you know, yeah. the, that ends up becoming, you know, couched and enveloped within the same like paradigm and ideology that people kind of develop mm -hmm. a bad taste for. And look at it now, right? The critical race theory panic, it's all you know it's mostly like white parents being like they're telling my son that he's white and he's evil you know and like this like anti-white yeah. shit is getting normalized that it's like like that there's genuine anti-white racism is like you watch tucker carlson and he won't shut up about it right yeah 
yeah. yeah. So Bryant, like how how's your kind of engagement and I guess um yeah, what's your engagement been with that kind of like, you know, those individuals who I guess they tie themselves up with like leftist scholarship. Mm. Like what's what's it been like interacting with them and stuff? Your experience? I don't know if I've had many experiences with them though. No. No. Okay. I could have sworn but like we've like, talked about this experience before. Someone with it? Like, like someone in the past. I don't think Yeah. Yeah. Or anti masculine. Well that that like, I mean I've that heard I kind I've, of Go ahead. have felt personally. Cause I you know, I've had a lot of discussions with Will about masculinity and kind of feeling I think maybe this is why I've been attracted to Jordan Peterson because obviously his, his Mm -hmm. whole philosophy and his whole teaching, you know, does target men and men that seem to be lost in, in some way or confused about their own masculinity. And I think I fall under that to some extent. Mm -hmm. So with that, yes, I think, in my own personal experiences and seeing mainstream media kind of attack masculinity. Yeah. I do feel it's just, yeah, to a large extent, I do feel lost. And and I've had discussion with Will, like, or, you know, what does it mean to be a man um, nowadays? How has it changed? Um, How am I supposed to behave? How am I supposed to think? How do I interact with, you know, being straight, how do I f- interact with females and dating and relationships? Um, that's been more my experience. I, I can't really speak to this whole, you know, critical race thing and, yeah. you know, anti-white. Um, mm-hmm. Just because maybe I, I try I, I try to stay away from that. At least people who, you know, um, like to get into that whole thing. <sighs> yeah, know. it also, like, makes sense, you know, like... Uh... Like with Jordan Peterson, you know, like it, at least I th- I get my idea is right. Well, when it comes to like masculinity, mm-hmm. femininity, like these things to some degree, at least like exist and there are things that we associate with them and it's culturally variable and stuff, but there's, there, there is masculinity and there is femininity and like, we don't want to completely get rid of either of them. But when it comes to like, race and whiteness right we 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 tend to be more aware of like the sort of like mythology of it all like you know there's there's not like well like how does one be a a good white person or like you know Mm -hmm. like in you know being a man right is something that every man sort of wants to do but unless you're a white nationalist and like being a white person isn't really like you know a goal um so there's no like corresponding jordan Mm -hmm. peterson who's like you know Men, men have been left behind. I, I mean, if there are, they're white nationalists. They're like, white people have been left behind. We need to secure a, 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 a future and a home for our white children. And that, so like, but people re- recognize that that's like bad. So um, I, I can understand why. And when it comes to like the, the masculinity thing with like Jordan Peterson, I totally like get the appeal because, but I think I'm sort of in a different like, maybe a more unique spot with it because I really have no idea what masculinity is like supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So like I have, uh, I was raised by two women, right? I have two moms, they're lesbian and I never had like a sort of like father figure growing up. Sometimes people ask, well, like which one of your moms was like the, you know, the, the dad in the relationship. I'm like, neither dude, do do you understand? Like, that's the whole Mm. point there. There isn't one, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) but yeah. So like, I so like I mean I I would like have like you know male role models outside of my family and even inside my family like uncles and stuff but mm-hmm. um there was never like this uh, you know I never like I don't know I I feel like my peers and my friends have had like it, these like bonding experiences with their dad that like that they like feel like you know, they, they, they can like use that as like a reference point of like how to be a man or something like that. And I'm like, I don't know, dude, like what, mm. you know, what is it? And so it seems to me, I mean, I know we know masculinity is 
very variable, right? In India, it's normal for men to walk down the street holding hands with each That's other. That's right, yeah. It's not normal here to do that. Um, mm-hmm. And so to me, I don't even really... So I, I am actually like a fan of like criticizing the, the what I see as the toxic manifestations, the the sort of exaggerations, the excesses of masculinity that our culture can promote. Um, yeah. Especially having like, you know, had experiences around like, you know, sports and like fraternities and stuff like that. And like seeing just like that, like that, that raw excess, yeah. the homophobia, the repression of emotions, like all this yep. stuff is really bad. And it's not just bad for other people. Like it sucks for men themselves. Like it's, it's just unhealthy. It's not a good way to be. It's not a good way to live. So, um, and that, yeah, and that's, that stuff I, I mean, completely I, agree I, on. I like, yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I, I definitely think mm-hmm. that's toxic, repressing emotions, you know, playing into this whole very stereotypical traditional male, like I'm mm. tough kind of thing. I, for sure, I I don't agree with that. I don't think that's good for us, for us guys. But I think where I'm more confused on is, yeah. is more of, I think nowadays, I almost just feel bad bad for being a guy in general i and i think that's where i Uh feel lost like all right then how do you know like where do i even start where where do i how do i behave um what's what's appropriate what's not it almost just seems like just everything is is anti-male is it be do you think that that has to do with like the fact that it seems to me that like in the past and for, uh, like really until like very recently, all of the sort of go to like examples of like gender roles and how one can be a man in a relationship or in a family have been like mm-hmm. patriarchal, like in, in like in, in, in many ways, like also the fact that, you know, now women are a lot more financially they're more financially independent than they ever yeah. have been before and so now you have like okay well you you have like stay at home dads in some relationships you have like oh you know my wife makes more than me like oh it, it, is that a problem like there's mm-hmm. all these like new sorts of uh phenomena that men have not really like had to deal with before and like it seems like the first reaction to that is usually a sort of like rejection and like a kind of fear because mm-hmm. the, con- the, the 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 like deep conception we have of what it is to be a man is so rooted in just like these traditional um things that are just sort of totally opposite to that you know All right i wonder <clears throat> i think the other thing i think of what it means to be a man, this notion is, and I think Bryant, you're touching on this, like in terms of asking, like Mm -hmm. what even is your role? And, and I think earlier talking about like being criticized for being a man. And I think, you know, that that's something that men are trash. I think people, right. Yeah. I say, (laughs) I think I've said that, you know, (laughs) I think I wonder to what extent is like, you know, being a man is already a shameful endeavor, right? Because, you know, you have these standards that are fucked up, but you're kind of expected to live up to. Um, But then you kind of have more shame piled on top of it with like, why do you have to be such a, yeah, why do you have to be trash? Or why, why you are a representative of the patriarchy right now. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't feel safe, you know, like, I think there's, there's parts of it that then lumps shame on top of other shame. And, I don't you know. I've, recently I was reading Brene yeah. Brown, for example, and, um, and she was talking about how, you know, being a man and men's vulnerability is hard even for women to accept. Yeah. Right. Um, and that kind of came up in her research and she's a social worker and she does like interviews and stuff. And I think 
I think it's so hard because I, I think it's interesting, first of all, that the conversation went from postmodernist and, you know, critical theory to now talking yeah. about like social issues, mm-hmm. like everyday issues of like, oh, what's it, what's it even like being a man and being criticized heavily? And, and I think what each of you is touching on right now is that, um, Brian, earlier you said men are lost. And right now, Sam, you're saying that the traditionalist roles that men have traditionally had are kind of sh- have shifted so much that that kind of leaves this kind of blank space that yeah. men might have some difficulty filling. It's kind of like um, a Nietzsche, like a Nietzsche and God is dead, but for gender. Mm-hmm. Right, right. No, and I think that's why yeah. men are lost because the roles have changed so dramatically that I almost feel at least again, from my personal experience and maybe from a couple of friends that I have as well, that it's because women have changed so much, then what is there left for the guys to do if the women can just fend for themselves and they don't really need us? So, uh, yeah. So Hmm. I think one, just like, I'll just inject like a, from my personal experience, like, I think in this, I've been in three relationships with uh, Mm -hmm. women, right? Girls for the first two, because I was, you know, what, 17, 18. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, the last one was like the first real like serious one and like very mature on a level where we can talk about anything and we're frequently talking to each other about the quality of the relationship and our needs and, you know, what, how that's going. And... I realized just through that how much like how much of what was just wrong with my first two relationships was just a lack of communication and just like sort of assumptions often built on certain assumptions that I was making about like, oh, you know, I'm the man or whatever, you know, I this is, oh, I can't do this. Like, mm-hmm. this isn't what a, what you know, what a guy does or something like that. And then just like, just through communication, because like, you know, if, you know, assume there is some like balance between masculine and feminine energy in a romantic relationship. And if romantic relationships nowadays are not going to be like guy with the, all the masculine energy and then girl with all the feminine energy or whatever. Right. And this is, I I don't really know what I'm talking about (laughs) here. This is sort of just like a metaphor for what I'm trying to get across is like, okay, well that balance, because we all have both masculine and feminine energy. And so say we're going to get, I'm, you know, now going to be more in touch with my feminine energy and she's going to be more in touch with her masculine energy or whatever. And I'm, I don't know what that would like map onto, but the fundamental thing is just through the communication, Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. because if, if, if you just rely on the assumptions of how, you know, traditionally things were right oh i'm gonna come home you know this is gonna happen blah 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 especially like i see it like with like certain family members right the man of the house will come home be like oh horrible day at work time for dinner right and then the you know the woman is cooking and it's she's kind of fed up because she's you know doesn't she's not appreciated and just like this classic like shitty dynamic Mm -hmm. that just because no one talks about because people don't make their you know they don't speak their needs into existence and like sort of just like confront because that's uncomfortable it caused all sorts of problems and i just yeah i'm rambling i'm rambling yeah I think that's true, though, like in terms of um, relationships and communication, I think there's a level that I think we're really ignorant of. And it's because we're never taught it. We kind of have to learn as we go. And you're lucky if you're willing to go to therapy to kind of like delve a little bit deeper. Mm. And it's the fact that a lot of the times there's communication on multiple levels, right? Like there's the yeah the the overt you're gonna talk with someone and share with them something that you might be feeling but there's another level that i think relationships operate and that's that 
you know, the one that you mentioned about assumptions and how often are we operating on assumptions and we're on autopilot mm-hmm, like that, mm-hmm. you know, and that's just going on for as long as we're not aware of it. And we like, there's always going to be something that we're not aware of, even if you are like trying to actively figure it out. And I think that just makes it all the much harder because, and I guess this loops back to like post-structural theory, hey. which is the fact that, um, you know, post-structuralism. And I th- think this is one of the criticisms it gets that I don't, necessarily think people like Lindsay and Pearson explicitly say, but the supposed like death of the individual of post-structuralism, right? Mm. Like, Oh, they, the no, they say constant. it. Yeah. They say it. Oh yeah. Okay. I don't, okay. But yeah, like there's that aspect of it, right? The fact that we're also replicating these patterns and this, they're the patterns of like, like you mentioned, Sam, the, maybe the, the father figures or the male figures in our lives that maybe we've modeled off of, which dips into psychology, right? Like the fact that we're modeling off of like the people around us, at least to some extent, but then we're modeling off of like broader, like cultural models mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. we we're also surrounded by. And yeah, I think all of that kind of gets put into play. And then, you know, then all of a sudden there's the questions of like power and all of that, that gets <laughs> like thrown into it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those those French philosophers, man. Yeah. yeah. No, with yeah. me with, with with Jordan, um, I, I've I've taken his message more just for my individual self because I mm-hmm. I try not to get into much of the political side of it. Um, for me, his message is obviously talks a lot about you know as individuals yeah responsibility responsibility, doing our best um and that's the way i've taken his message is to like i you know i'm 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 focused on myself yeah definitely what what can i do to better myself to contribute to my community you know um, i think that's that's what i try to focus Mm -hmm. more on yeah and he can be good for that like you know people do have to clean their rooms and sometimes you do need an old man <laughs> yelling at you to get motivated to clean yeah. your room. So, I mean, yeah, no, like I definitely think if there's anything that like Peterson, where Peterson actually does sort of do good and put good into, you know, the, the, the virtual space or to the world really out generally it's, it's with like empowering individuals who, who really need like, some motivation yeah. like he can do that very well because he's a gifted speaker he mm-hmm. he's he's authoritative and he's he can be inspiring sure yeah especially if you're looking if you're lost if you're looking for that help mm. you're looking for that voice <clears throat> yeah hmm. Hmm. all right it looks like we it almost seems um okay like that was like a mini to, episode or something it, it was right like I, I, you just like post that hesitate. separately <laughs> we could honestly Seriously. like it might be the best yeah. call yeah i i think it, it's almost like to now pivot towards like okay all right now let's talk about the philosophy the up, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um and I guess that's the thing, right? It's almost like we're having these two conversations, right? The first one is, yeah, this is the real issue that people on the ground are dealing with, right? This is where the rubber meets the road. And maybe this is exactly the place where people like Peterson and Lindsay really can thrive. Yeah, yeah. Because then the other side of it is like their attempts at critiquing specific scholars, it it only ever gets as deep as mm. Foucault and Derrida and never as deep as the actual people that they want to actually critique. Instead, there's just these broad strokes that only seem to rub academics and philosophers like the wrong way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's this, there's this like this, you, you, you sort of set me up perfectly for um, one of the points that I, 
don't make as often as I should and that I remember discussing when I went into a uh, a book club discussion of cynical theories that was but it was all just fans of the book who were just praising it just like they were all just heaping praise on this book and I went in there and was like I was like one of the first people to talk I didn't know what really what I was up for what I was uh, <laughs> stepping into and I was like yeah so I mean I have this, you know, one one of the things that I like least about this book is the way that they uh, characterize the postmodern philosophers in the, the first chapter. And, you know, they, they actually don't provide any citations. It's very vague. Uh, most of it is historically inaccurate, et cetera, et cetera. And I sort of talk for like two minutes and then the next person is like, you know, gets on the stage and they're like, yeah, I just thought this book was so good, man. You know, d- d- you know. Politically correct, <laughs> political correctness has gotten so crazy, you know, and just like I, you know, I, you know, the woke, you know, they don't even they they, they don't even want to debate. They they they, you know, they just think that they're right and I'm wrong and and I'm evil and I'm racist or whatever, you know, it's just like that, like 40 times. Right. Mm. Yeah. And so then I was like, I had this sort of like mini epiphany in there and I was like, well, look one of the things that I brought up was like, okay, the, the prop, one of the like problems from like a s- academic perspective of this book, especially when it gets into chapter eight, which is the one that I focus on in the, in the review that I wrote is they take the worst example, Robin D'Angelo, the one that has all of the easy, you know, easy to criticize, obviously, you know, non-rigorous ideas and arguments and then they project that onto all these other scholars who are just doing something completely different and they find it in all these scholars where one can't reasonably find it and in the and because they portray themselves as the experts they've gone and done all the research and the reading their reader is just going to sort of trust them and not going to go you know do their fact checking whatever but what attracts someone to even want to read a book like cynical theories in the first place is never you know some academic journal article that they came across because academics are not the market for the book right what what it always is is some person who sort of bought into this bought into some popular social justice idea because they thought it would give them more points in some social circle maybe, or, you know, it, with their friend group, they thought that this was the right thing. You know, they heard someone talking about intersectionality and they, you know, they want to, I don't know, they think that person's cute and they have a crush on them or whatever, like whatever it might be that gets people to sort of adopt these kinds of ideas out completely outside of like a, an intellectual environment, all sorts of, you know, social pressure things. And then they had a conversation with that with someone in their life and they were like, that's crazy, man. Like, oh, you think all white people are racist? Like, but I'm a white person. I'm not racist. And the other person was like, oh, that's really problematic. And then they felt like, you know, horrible. Right. And they're like, <laughs> oh, fuck this. I'm joining the Trump party. Mm. Uh, that's like what gets people to vote for or, or to want to, to wanna read that kind of scholarship. It's ne- It's never some actual academic sort of thing. Like it's always, so, so uh, as you were just saying, right, Will, uh, the, the appeal of a Jordan Peterson and a, and a Jimmy Concepts is that in their rigorous critique, that they, they, they appear to trace it back to its source. And so someone's like, oh, look, this is where it all comes from. So they give the, the, the person some sense of like understanding, right? Which makes them feel more secure. Okay. It's not just like people going crazy or whatever. It's like there is a source. And then the 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 way that they construe the crazy stuff that's coming out of the academic's mouth is really just through the most obnoxious activists that they have seen engaging in this sort of behavior. So it's recognizable to the person who hasn't read any scholarship, but has experience with these sort of like 
left wing ideas um, that people can mm. adopt dogmatically. And so it's like it it's and and you see it anytime like I would engage in like the criticism of the book. People would always fall back on, well, look, that's not what they're really criticizing. They're they're not really criticizing the the scholars and the academics. They're really criticizing, you know, what it mm-hmm. has led to because these ideas have bled into greater society and they're affecting, you know, right? Uh, you, oh, go watch the evergreen, uh, the evergreen college thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Go watch, uh, you know, mm-hmm. go, go, go to a HR training, go to a diversity training. So the way that they've like set it all up is perfect because you can criticize everything in the book and it doesn't matter because they don't, they don't read it for that scholarship. They read it because Mm -hmm. it, it, it resonates with their actual experience with things uh, just in life. Right. So do you guys think if I'm understanding you guys correctly, the, the error here is people like Peterson are going for, the easy targets without, I don't know, I guess delving deeper into where these theories come from or. So not exactly that it's that, so they can go for the easy targets all they want, but they're, they're painting that as part of this sort of like borderline conspiratorial, but like just, just this more like, story of like look it's the academics they're at the root of it all Mm -hmm. right they had these ideas and they've bled into society or they're indoctrinating new and new generations and that's how we got all these ideas into society when really i think a lot of this is just more organic like you know like 13 year old kids on tumblr just sort of one-upping each other in the woke game Mm -hmm. right rather than learning something in a college classroom and then thinking that Oh, I got, I got to think that now. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, so like they, they can focus on those, those easy targets all they want, but they should just identify them as those easy targets rather than, you know, saying that that's what Foucault and Derrida are saying. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think I, I, that makes sense to me too. Right. I think, that kind of and and that is well reflected in the comments that I've read from for our video, right? Like some of the people who have been more reasonable have said, "Well, I think you guys are missing the broader point right. of their real right. critique," and you know, you guys kind of missed out on not touching on that. That was like the spirit of it. I've I've gotten um, that so but, many times that I'm just like, I yeah, yeah, and and I guess the thing that reminds me of is um, you know. Deleuze has a really interesting quote um, where he says that the irrational, the rational is carved from the irrational. And I like it because it it just seems so like, yeah. And his, his examples are like, you know, capitalism makes sense if you like believe in the value of a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. Like it completely irrational, but it creates this seemingly perfectly rational system. It's very human. Yeah. 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 He can be. And same thing with religion, right? He says that it's, you know, it's rational, completely rational and whatever, as long as you're willing to accept like the immaculate conception, the virgin birth, that God came down from heaven and made himself man and, you know, all these yeah. seemingly irrational things, right? <clears throat> um, and I, I think kind of to change that, I think what we're seeing, I think, from everyone is that everyone has diagnosed some issue, some problem that hasn't really felt very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think this is also reflected in the comments. And I think I've certainly been guilty of it is, you know, to say, you know, people are getting too emotional. And and I, I zero in on that because I think I heard that in you know, the comments that we received on the first video is that, oh, we're too emotional. Like we were, we're not really focusing on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. Okay. Um, uh, and, and I think, I think ultimately that's a tactic to kind of like discredit. And I, I say that I've been guilty of it because I certainly have in the past. And, and I think that kind of discounts the fact that to be human is to be, to have emotions. And, 
all that does is perpetuate this idea that you know to be emotional is mm. to be irrational and illogical mm. when yeah. i think our logic is carved from very like emotions or just <laughs> that seem irrational but are they have a certain rationality and logic to it like i look at relationships and love right relationships they're this seemingly logical thing but they are carved from the irrational because when it comes down to it why do any like why do these two people oh, yeah. whoever mm-hmm. they are last 50 years out of irrational love and connection that you can't really pinpoint exactly what it is mm-hmm. and i think taking it to this conversation i think there's a lot of things people are feeling and people are finding expression in certain ways and you know we're trying to ultimately meet that with nah but they they fuck up here <laughs> you know? right right and they do yeah they do and it's but, not gonna yeah it's, it's just not gonna um it's not gonna click they're like they're, they're like mm-hmm. that's not what i'm talking about right yeah yeah people i think people are just speaking past each other at that point and we have at least you know according to commenters because i wanted to talk about the book i want to talk about the text <laughs> you know i want to talk about the uh-huh. arguments <laughs> yeah yeah of course and well how how far along are you now in your your program i know this is like completely i just off finished topic, my second year nice yeah i think i saw you post a post that you're you're done with classes right and you started TAing or teaching now right oh oh no i'm not done with classes but it's it's my second oh, no. i i taught this whole year and i'll teach okay every year till i'm done yeah nice okay well you know i think that's a part of it right the fact that yeah part of it's being students but the part of it is also being academics right like wanting to engage mm-hmm. you know with ideas and i think on some level that you know, I think one commenter, which I thought was, I, I didn't think it was particularly fair, but, you know, he said that we were, um, um, God, what's, what's, what's the word for it? You know, like kind of like armchair, kind of like in the ivory oh, tower, like navel like gazing? so disconnected. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's me. And that's kind of what our issue is. <laughs> and you know, I don't, I don't agree with that. Cause that just says that, you know, we're completely dis connected from it and therefore ultimately we don't know what we're talking from about what? um but i do think that it okay from the real world the, the fact that people are like really mm-hmm. having to deal with certain issues and um and i guess the the thing i want to kind of bring here is the fact that i think the truth in there if it's to be found is the fact that a part of being a phd student is engagement in a way that other people aren't really interested in. It's navel gazing. You know? and I, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It is part of our job, you know? We're academics. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is probably the one largest critique that you have right now about, I guess, what's been said, whether by... Lindsay or uh, Chris Rufo, who I know that he's kind of fallen in your lap at this point. That and motherfucker. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, I know it's it's been a lot, right? Like, I guess okay. Like, there's there's one thing I, I wanted to kind of touch on, I guess, before we go there, which is the fact that you know, since our last conversation, it looks like a lot of the stuff that Lindsay said in critical theories has kind of he's walked it back yeah. a bit yep right yep. um especially like because you attended um a lecture by him and thaddeus russell and a three lectures um, a little a whole little class oh, yeah, three lectures. yeah i paid for and it and that, everything oh you did <laughs> uh, and it seemed like he was much more respectful of like foucault for example which yep, yep. it almost seemed like, oh, that undercuts all of my criticisms <laughs> of like Lindsay. If he's like, oh, Foucault's great. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it just. But he was also up there with Thad and Thaddeus Russell is a huge Foucault fan. And so, th- right. so this is, oh. you, you can see the sort of precursors to this change in Lindsay's um, assessment of the postmodernists. 
if you go back to the first time that he and Helen went on Thaddeus Russell's show, and this was sometime last year, beginning of pandemic, March or April-ish, hmm. to talk about the book, to promote the book. And um, in that discussion, it's like two and a half hours, pretty long, uh, it's revealed a couple times that Helen and James have this disagreement about the source of the social justice scholarship, the woke, the wokeness that they um, find so problematic. Mm-hmm. They have this disagreement about, you know, what's the more influential branch? The two main branches being the Frankfurt School critical theory, which which Lindsay thinks is the the mm-hmm. main culprit, and postmodernism, which uh, Helen Pluckrose thinks is the main culprit, and because. Helen, so a lot of people don't know this. Helen basically wrote the entire first draft of the book. Um, and then James came in and sort of like added some shitty metaphors and some sort of like dumb zingers and uh, maybe, maybe contributed, you know, one chapter that was like mostly him. I think he contributed quite a bit to chapter eight, um, the one that I focused on criticizing. But it, the, the book is mostly Helen's work. And um, so that's part of the reason why the book, the narrative in the book is just the postmodernism. You know, you get, you get references to, you get, you get clarification uh, between the, uh, of the distinction between postmodernism and critical theory as in the Frankfurt school in like a, in like a footnote once or twice. Um so Lindsay really thinks that it's like Marcuse and Gramsci and Adorno and Horkheimer, but mostly Marcuse mm. is, is his big guy that he uh, rails against. And he, he, he tends to go against Gramsci a good amount too. So that's what the mm. first two entire classes for this, you know, it was supposed to be postmodernism and critical theory. And the first two entire classes, we ended up just doing critical theory. And it was clear that he didn't know his Horkheimer. Mm. He barely knew his Adorno. He like kind of knew his Gramsci and he knew his Marcuse. And that's that's who he was like most uh, upset about. (laughs) But by the time, you know, I come in there Mm. hoping that I can voice my criticisms about his representation of the postmodernists, because that's what I get from the book. By the time we get there, really Thad starts to take over and is giving more accurate representations mm. of Foucault's work because he knows Foucault's work much better than than Lindsay does. And, you know, when they try to do Derrida, they like half ass it because they don't know what they're, you know, they're like, oh, Derrida, he, you know, he's super hard, um, which I don't blame them for, you know, Derrida. Yeah, he, mm. he is hard to understand, but Basically, so like, I was like, oh, shit, like, now I don't really have any criticisms to raise because we didn't talk about, (laughs) you you didn't accuse Foucault of the nonsense that is is accused of him in the book, right? And so I asked him that, like, I got to ask one question at the end, right, in the last session. I was like, so what happened? Mm -hmm. Like, why why do you have such a different... uh, take from the one that I found in cynical theories. And he was like, well, you know, most of that is because like Helen mostly wrote that book and uh, we were already way over the word limit and we couldn't add all the the Frankfurt school stuff. And we wanted to talk about fat studies and, um, and yeah. that, that was basically his, his answer. Um, and, he, and now he wants to focus and, and now, you know, he's, he's really all in on the critical theory stuff, which is worrying because people who focus on the Frankfurt School, you get the cultural Marxism, anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, mm-hmm. which he has yeah. pushed hard on Twitter. Um, and and you can tell that he's consuming content from like the real originators of the theory who were just spewing propaganda. Like I've seen him make false claims that only these uh anti-semitic you know real paleo conservative types william lind paul wyrick these people who were like behind the Hmm. think tanks pushing this stuff um 
so yeah, so pushing, making it all about Frankfurt school is a big new step. And that's played a huge role in this whole critical race theory panic because one Republicans are a lot of Republicans are already familiar with those dog whistles around cultural Marxism and they know they can exploit them. And two, you just have the connection to Marxism. You just start saying Marxism and we're like, you know, we're the United States. That's like, you know, the, the, that, that's the go-to <laughs> boogeyman is Marx or communism. And so it's been very effective for him yeah. to play on this trope. Yeah. Yeah. That's been interesting that there has been that big of a pivot, right? From mm-hmm. critiquing postmodernists to like walking it back and not being like, no, they were fine. And I didn't really do that. <laughs> yeah, to now yeah. just going hard <laughs> against the critical theorists. Um, do you think there's going to be a time where it's going to walk those back? No, no, he's no, he's committed to the critical theorists. I mean, like, I don't see, you know, where else he would go. You know, those are basically like your options. You say that, oh, like Foucault somehow, Foucault, you know, like people were accusing Foucault of being a neoliberal by the end of his life. You know, like this dude (laughs) is not like that (laughs) crazy radical. Uh, Helen Pluckrose is just convinced that he thinks like truth doesn't exist or something. And so like, oh, they were. Ah, he, you know, he ruined everything or like that. They they like spin something he said about, you know, the the episteme that is like relative to a particular uh, civilization or culture at a, a, in a specific time period, which you can also find in like Marx and Hegel and stuff, but like take that and then be like, oh, this means that, you know, all knowledges are equally valid. And so, if there's an indigenous person who like can communicate with a plant, then I have to say that that's knowledge or, you know, whatever. And they Mm -hmm. just start doing this whole thing. Um, They're Mm -hmm. like, Oh, truth. Oh, voodoo. Now I can just do voodoo or some shit. Um, And that, so like that's (laughs) the Helen route. That's, and then there's the James Lindsay route, which is the, I think the much more pernicious one, the, the more dangerous one which is like these Jewish intellectuals are pushing Marxist ideology Mm -hmm. secretly into our schools, indoctrinating our children so that we can destroy Western civilization. Like that, that is the whole thing. Yeah. That's crazy. Cause I, I I think the first time I heard that was like 11 years ago or 12 years ago after high school, like someone from like high school, was like posting that kind of stuff. And I was like, holy shit, that's, that's crazy. Because I Googled it and I was like, cultural Marxism. Yeah. That sounds yeah. legit, but I don't never heard that before and going into it. It's like, holy shit. Um, but I think the thing that you said about Foucault, right? I, I guess to offer a specific thing is like, you know, I think the end, the last Foucault, right? Or what they referred to as like the third Foucault, like his last scholarship on like, care of the self and mm-hmm. the stuff he pulled from like you know the ancients right where the he's like doing Greek ethics Roman. you know yeah straight up ethics mm-hmm. and talking about the individual and you know stuff that i think has some like i would imagine peterson would have some affinity yeah for. yeah for sure but he totally he's never read him it's so clear he's focused. never read him mm-hmm. yeah or read his first book on like birth of the clinic maybe or you know, and, and that's the other thing is right. Like Foucault has a background with psychology as well, mm-hmm. and that's why he is able to critique it in you know in in his work. <laughs> but you know, it's yeah, it's it's so easy I think to like simplify arguments into this like little thing that can be easily dismissed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, in with respect to like critical race theory. What do you think has been like the most, I guess, egregious misrepresentation mm. that you've heard from, let's say, Lindsay or or someone like Chris Rufo? Oh, man. I mean, so Rufo, Rufo's like just admits to his whole, his whole project is just misrepresentation. Um, 
you've probably seen me sharing these two tweets all the time, or a lot of people just sharing these two tweets in succession, a screenshot of him. And I, I have him right here. This is what he says. Just like he just tweets. It. I mean, he's actually responding to Lindsay, who's saying like, you know, actually, I think we're making progress. Like critical race theory is like, you know, it's it's definitely not like gone, but it's, you know, it's it's wounded or something like that. And then Rufo responds, we have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation, and we're steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. Mm -hmm. So just explicitly saying my goal is to basically turn critical race theory into an one size fits all boogeyman term, kind of like socialism, communism, right? For, for conservatives, the way that it has been, uh, you know, it, I mean, it, it, think of it as like the word gay, right? You know, like like 20 years ago, right? Little, like teenage guys be like, mm-hmm. oh, that's fucking gay, man, right? And what does that mean? Mm-hmm. I don't like it, you know, that, but, and, and, it could, and it could mean that in so many different ways, the way that people use that term. That's how I think about the way that, that this guy is using critical race theory. And if you, if you look for discourse on Twitter about, you know, how are people using this term? And, and now also in the news, how are parents using the term, right? Parents who are, Hmm. who are going to school board meetings and lashing out and going on tirades and then getting invited onto Tucker Carlson. Uh, like, you know, so first of all, I've seen, I, I saw Candace Owens tweet that critical race theory was the new Jim Crow. I saw, uh, I mean, I've seen it many times in just like those short little city journal articles that basically propelled Rufo into the spotlight over this stuff. Uh, he's comparing it to the KKK. He's saying it's basically just like the KKK, but reversed again, playing on this whole anti-white mm. racism uh, trope. And I've seen, you know, parents claim that Hitler was a critical race theorist, that the Ku Klux Klan were critical race theorists that uh, I, I I just saw someone saying that yo this critical race theory you're teaching our kids is uh, you're teaching a, you're teaching them Black Panther curriculums and you're telling them to murder police officers. Just you know she she said it with conviction she she was she really seemed to believe it and. It's yeah, it's 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 whatever. It's critical race theory. Everything's critical race theory, apparently, and it's just become the sort of term for anything vaguely race related that I don't like. Uh, you know, it's the, the mm-hmm. it's it, it's what the conservatives I think are really like best at is is manipulating language in certain ways and like setting the terms of the debate, which is I don't know why exactly it is. I think part of it has to do with like people on the left generally having somewhat more integrity and like valuing distinctions more. Um, And people on the right, right now, especially in our political moment, just sort of realizing that they don't really have any genuine material policies that are very popular uh, on like a large scale. And so they have to cling on to culture war politics to, 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 you know, hold on to their base. Basically, they have to make it look like the left is just destroying mm. America, so that they can continue to gerrymander their districts and have some shot at getting elected. I wanted to ask you guys. Hmm. I think that would just be helpful for me and for for viewers. What would be a more accurate representation of critical race theory? Good question. So. A lot of people, uh, I, I've posted a couple of videos on my YouTube channel that's, you know, not really a YouTube channel yet, but like I've been involved in some things. I was on this this um, panel that's like almost two hours mm-hmm. discussing this 
on a uh, Brittany King's channel. I think I thought it it, it it went pretty well. You know, we had three pro critical race theory people, three anti. And uh, one of the most common comments is like, but you guys never even defined it. You guys never even defined it. Uh, and then even now I saw when I, I was invited on Jamil Giovanni's radio show to debate about critical race theory. And I tried to be explicit and give a definition. Um, and then I just saw today somebody commented like, but hey, you never even defined it. <laughs> it's like, well, okay. I don't know what people are expecting with the, with the definition of critical race theory. But it's it's almost destined to be somewhat disappointing because critical, you know, it it, it makes it sound like it's a theory, right? Like the theory of of uh, of gravity or some shit, or the theory of I don't know, uh, the theory of uh, utilitarianism or something, as if it's like okay, we can specify like the main principle and then what follows from that and like how how it works or whatever, but not really. Like it's, it's more just like a sort of academic movement. And this is how the scholars who are most involved with it tend to define it. They say, well, look, critical race theory is a movement of legal scholars, mostly scholars uh, of color, who uh, saw the efforts of the civil rights movement in the 60s as, you know, Good, good efforts, but as ultimately inadequate to ending systemic racism in our country, basically. They're saying, well, look, we have to see the ways in which racism continues to be perpetuated, uh, even though the law is now, uh, you know, uh, by mandate, colorblind or race neutral. So that's the way that I think that, that's like the basic starting point is like they want to say like look it hasn't done what it has what the civil rights movement has not fulfilled its promises Mm -hmm. um and so what we have to do is have to interrogate the ways in which racism the law and just sort of american institutions it's specifically an american thing how they interact and how that continues to perpetuate racial inequality, racial injustice. And that's like the main thing that they all have in common. They also would all be social constructionists about race. They reject, you know, biological essentialist accounts of race. And they say, you know, race is a social construction and they want to look at how the law has actually sort of, the law has defined or has a, as uh how, how much you say it has sort of been has acted as sort of like a border patrol of racial concepts so if you look at the united states history right mm-hmm. for a long time people like people we now consider white weren't white irish italian immigrants um weren't considered white and there were only like these two racial categories black and white so they were considered black at the time right then eventually they, you know, got, uh, there, there were like legal rulings that would, you know, courts would declare them, okay, now you're white or whatever. Um, and for a long time, there were still just these, these two racial categories. So like, okay, well, where do Mexican people fit in there? Are they white or are they black? Right. Mm-hmm. And that was like a, a serious issue for a long time. And eventually we got past the, the, the two categories, but like that still continues to be a thing. Um, and, you know, also, you know, things like, uh, how there could be, uh, mandatory minimums for a drug like (laughs) crack cocaine, but not for powder cocaine. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't explicitly mention race, but we know that one race, African-Americans, black Americans are going to use crack cocaine at a higher rate than they use powder cocaine and white Americans, vice versa. Mm Mm-hmm. And so if you have like a law that even though it doesn't mention race at all, it is, you know, a racist law. So these are the sorts of things that critical race theorists do. Then it's spread into different institutions, right? And it, different disciplines outside of the law, right? Philosophy, education, sociology. And uh, to just the, the, the 
you know, there's not a, there's not like a set of principles that they all agree on or anything like that. It's more just sort of like approach movement, um, kind of like a school of thought, I guess. Yeah. I think that's a really good way of putting it. Like a lot of people address and talk about issues involving race. Not everyone who does is, is it, necessarily right. a critical race theorist. Right. And definitely. Richard Spencer is often, not a, often, <laughs> a critical race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think the thing that's linked with that is how, um, you know, it's also about pulling from a certain body of scholarship. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Often, like when, at this point, what makes a discipline itself is they pull from a certain type of scholarship, and critical race theorists pull from a specific type of scholarship. I think, you know, in anthropology, for example, like, I guess, you know, coming from medical anthropology, like there's a lot of in, impactful, I think, racialized um, health phenomena that mm -hmm. have really crept up, right? And is the fact that um, like there's just certain beliefs that the medical establishment still to this day have about, let's say black women or black men, black people's bodies that aren't true, but have been seemingly empirically true. Right. Like, um, I think you posted this Sam recently and it was, it was by, uh, Alan Goodman, who's like a really noteworthy, um, biological anthropologist. And he was, he was talking about how, um, like checking for osteoporosis for African Americans is often kind of rejected by doctors. Like they don't really do mm -hmm. it. If they ask for it, they kind of reject it, say, no, you don't need it. Whenever there's like large efforts to like reach out to people for osteoporosis, they tend to get ignored. The reason for that being that I guess it seems empirically that they ha they're at lower risk for it. But the reality is, you know, it seems to map onto race. And so that perpetuates this belief that there's this biological evidence for race. But the reason for that is that, you know, there's a lot of factors that impact stuff like bone density, right? And um, yeah, they can map onto socioeconomics. They can map onto what kind of employment people have, right? If you're more active mm -hmm. versus if you're sitting in an office, it's going to impact it. Um, yeah, so... There's a lot of factors to that. And ultimately, it just becomes so normalized that people believe that it's a racial issue when in reality, it's probably more accurate mm -hmm. to say that it's a social issue, an economic issue. But then all of a sudden, black people are still at, rate, at, at risk for osteoporosis because at the end of the day, that's all it really was, you know? Yeah. There's there's other interesting ones too. Like I, I took a class called Social Construction this past semester. And one of the things we were looking at is social construction of race. And for the reasons that you cite, one of the, you know, the, the main go-to reason you'll find academic articles arguing for like a biological conception of race is because they claim that this sort of thing is necessary for good, you know, medicine. Is that like, oh, like we, mm. we see these correlations between these races and you know, these diseases or, or these traits, et cetera. And so we need to have like a biological conception of race, but uh, they overlook important things, right? So, so for instance, one common, uh, it's kind of like a, it, it, it is basically a myth is that like sickle cell is a, like a black trait, right? That this is a trait that, you know, black people basically only get and they're way more likely than anyone else, than anyone who's not black to get it. But if you look at things rather than on a racial level, but on a more like ethnic group level in terms of the genetics, right? Or in terms of like haplogroups, right? Small. Yeah, more geographic. Right? You'll right. find that it's like, it's really, it's, it's not a black American thing or, or a black thing. It's like this certain region that's like the northern western coast of Africa is it's high in sickle cell, but also the Mediterranean, right? Italians, Sicilians, um, Spaniards, Portuguese. These people are also rather high in 
likelihood to get sickle cell compared to anyone else. And if you go down to South Africa, virtually no one has it, right? But those people are just as black as the people who come from the Western coast. So Mm -hmm. a lot of it is too, is like, you know, just an oversimplification and looking at things in like essentialized biological racial categories when the genetics is far more complicated and just can't be, you know, sorted that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good example of how things get so normalized. And then once we believe in it, it's hard to like Mm -hmm. mess with that kind of belief because now it's like, well, we have the medical evidence for it. And yeah, that's such a, that's like the perfect example of it. Cause I know I grew up, you know, kind of hearing that and feeling like, Oh, I guess that's true. Right. Like that Tupac song. Um, <laughs> uh, who was he talking about? But he said, have a Caesar. What's the song? You, you got sickle cell. You ain't feeling well. <laughs> oh, I don't even know. That song. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have a Caesar on stage. <laughs> have a Caesar on stage. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was talking about someone. Oh, no. Um, um, Oh, by the way, the song is hit him up. <laughs> oh, it's hit him up. Wait, so him so up, he's yeah. talking about Biggie. Really? He's talking about Mob Deep. He's talking about Mob Deep. So he's talking about a bunch of people. So in when he's song. talking about Sickle Cell, he's talking about someone from Mob Deep. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's, so it's yeah. But anyways, that was <laughs> a bit of a, um, uh, yeah. And I think critical race theory. Yeah, it's. I have a professor who engages with it a lot more than like others who are still like focused on race, but like, you know, she's a chair of the department right now. The other side of it is like Frankie, uh, my girlfriend, she is a forensic anthropologist in the department and her advisor, Dr. John Bethard in forensic anthropology, there's this big issue of like ancestry, Mm -hmm. which recent like critical reviews have basically said that this use of ancestry in forensic anthropology is basically still race because people still say African-American, white, Hispanic, like they, they still chunk it out in these, you know, weird ways that still don't kind of make sense because they don't really help to actually identify like human remains. Especially so like, like even Hispanic. On a practical level. The, Hispanic is such a weird one, dude. <laughs> yeah. That makes no sense. Well, how, what that's like, <laughs> three continents right that people yeah. are hispanic because like, hispanic just means like spanish speaking like your your family uh-huh. your origin like speak spanish mm-hmm. like <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah it's... seriously yeah it's like europe north america south america at least because you also have right. spanish speakers mm-hmm. all over the world really yeah. um but yeah i guess that's that's the issue right there's like these practical realities that are problematic and interfere with like you mentioned sam like yeah justice and you know the perpetuation of injustices and um all this gets tied up with i guess the rhetoric that we hear from i guess people who are sounding these alarms (laughs) and i guess should they Mm -hmm. be sounded in the ways that they are it's kind of one of the questions right Mm -hmm. yeah so I talked about Rufo's big fucking misrepresentation. His his whole his whole career is a misrepresentation, and so is James Lind's, James Lindsay's, but at least in a more respectable way sometimes. Um, right. But James Lindsay's big, you know, so so sometimes he'll go on the whole critical race theory is like anti Western, and so they think that. You can't even use reason in the debate. Like he's largely realized that people know that that's horseshit. Um, so the the big one that he's constantly emphasizing, and this one is is what I see. You know, I I don't know if you've ever noticed because I have all these people muted by now, but I have an army of like five or six, sometimes even ten, like trolls who respond to almost all of my posts. Um. <laughs> just like being like so you have a following when when are you gonna answer this criticism sam when are you gonna talk about this oh look here's kimberly crenshaw saying like something about liberalism what what about that you know and the the mm-hmm. it, it really stems from as far as i could tell 
Lindsay really pushing these couple of lines from Richard Delgado in the intro to critical race theory text, where he says basically that critical race theorists uh, question the very foundations of the liberal order, enlightenment, rationalism, uh, neutral constitutional uh, interpretation or something like that. Right. And so he's like saying that critical race theorists question these things. And so therefore a lot of people interpret this as, you know, critical race theory rejects these things. And there are some of these scholars like don't do themselves any favors and sort of are, are just very like <laughs> very liberal with how anti-liberal they sound. You know, they'll, they'll just say like, oh, liberalism, <laughs> ah, fuck this, you know, liberalism sucks. And you hear this generally like on the left too, right? Like, like leftists will be like, oh, yeah, fucking liberal. Mm -hmm. Like it's a pejorative when, you know, <laughs> the basic, you know, values of liberalism, hey, freedom, like rights, like these things are, I don't know, kind of good. Anyways, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so like you can find a lot of places in critical race theory where they're like critical of liberalism. And James will always, James has twisted this to say, Critical race theory hates liberalism. It absolutely rejects liberalism. It eschews it. And so therefore, if it rejects liberalism, well, what's the alternative, right? They think He says that, you know, they want to destroy the liberal order and replace it with the critical race theory order. And so he, then he starts talking about Marxism. He starts talking about, you know, just the end of capitalism. And, you know, he starts fear mongering. But... What they're really talking about when they talk about that liberal stuff is they're talking about like a legal, like a trend in legal scholarship from like, from like the civil rights on. And they're talking about civil rights discourse, right? They're talking about colorblindness. They're talking about, uh, you know, meritocracy, these sorts of ideas that we associate with, that they associate with liberalism, that we might not always associate with liberalism. I just want to read this one passage from... I have right here, critical race theory, the uh, texts, the key mm. writings that form the movement, I believe this is 1995, edited by Kimberly Crenshaw and some others. So she wrote a long intro to this book. And at a certain part, she emphasizes how wrong Lindsay is when he talks about them being completely anti-liberal. So I just wanted to put this out real quick. So... Uh, she says, to be sure, while we have emphasized throughout the liberal and critical polls, emphasized throughout, based on this intro, the liberal and critical polls against which critical race theory developed, in experience, such dialectical relations produce less of a sharp break and more of a creative and contestatory engagement with both traditions. This is true not only of the content of critical race theory, but it's true as well of the workshop's participants. Indeed, both liberal race theorists and critical legal theorists have been deeply engaged in critical race discourse. Uh, so liberals welcome liberals. They, mm. they draw on liberalism and you can find in other people's uh, <coughs> texts as well, specifically people like Mari Matsuda and Angela Harris, explicit appeals to enlightenment uh, values, liberalism, um, you know, individual rights, etc. So that's one of the big ones that Lindsay mm. profits off of. Right. Yeah. It seems like just like with other things, it's like the characterization is just so far over that it's almost, it's just a caricature at that point. And yeah, I mean, I, it's like, what would it look like to actually engage with it? I guess more faithfully. And it's this the same kind of issue coming up over and over is like an unfaithful and I guess uncharitable um, deliberately engagement. Yeah. Because you see what yeah. what do they want? They want to ban this stuff, right? Hmm. And mm -hmm. they want to ban they want to ban more than just this stuff. They want to ban even at, uh, in some cases the state bills, you know, so the original state bills that both Rufo and Lindsay, no, sorry, they come from Trump's executive order. 
in the original language, mm. the way that it defines race or sex stereotyping, it prohibits that. The way that it defines it includes attributing to a race or sex or an individual based on their race or sex status or privilege. Now, mm. I went and looked up the definition of status, mm. and it basically means relative position. So basically, if, if you can't attribute to someone a status based on their race or sex, or you can't attribute to a racial or, or you know, a racial group or a sex, uh, a status, then you can't claim that sexism or racism exists, <clears throat> basically. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. if you take that language, as many of the bills do, and pass them on into saying, yeah, let's, let's, let's use this. We're, we're banning this stuff from school. It has very sweeping implications. And I'm, you know, to what extent Lindsay is actually aware of this? I think he probably is because I've seen people, you know, call him on it and he, he's like, he'll, he'll always come up with some excuse or whatever, but these people are, 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 are serious about banning this stuff. They just want it gone. And it's much more than the actual stuff that they're criticizing. Yeah. Again, it's like where the rubber meets the road, there's that, that gap. And I think people are going with it for that reason is that people do feel passionate about it and they're speaking to like feelings. And I think the misrepresentation ultimately doesn't even matter. You know, yeah. people are still going to, you know, speak on public forums, you know, with their congressmen or whatever and say that they should ban critical race theory because it's racist. And yeah, it's like any mention of race is now inherently racist. And, that's right. They, that's, um, that's, I mean, that's, yeah. look at the history of the U.S. What do conservatives not want us to do? Talk about the history of race. Talk about racism. They want us to shut up. Come on, sh just can you guys stop talking about that? Jeez. So yeah. where do we go from here? Like, what are, what are some tips for us general public? Do we learn more about what is what really is critical race theory? Do we delve deeper into the theorists? What do we do? So you could go and learn more about critical race theory. And for people who are interested, I totally recommend that you do. Um, but in some ways, I think what might be the best approach is for us to just stop using the term crit or at least stop, especially when we're in conversation with people we disagree yeah. with about this stuff. Like if I'm engaged in an argument with someone who thinks critical race theory should be banned, I'm going to say, all right, let's not use the word critical race theory right now. Cause you and I have different ideas of what that is. Let's like be specific and talk about what is what specific ideas, what specific arguments or which specific authors or or trainings that you've been suggested uh, subjected to or whatever, like because this term is like by design, it has been corrupted. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, I think it, it's, it's sort of long gone, like like you like hmm. you. I don't know how neurochemistry works, but I could be convinced that on some level in many conservatives' brains, they hear critical race theory and their ability to think critically sort of just shuts down because they, they associate it with these things that they have such hatred of and such, such fear of and such unwillingness to even really consider charitably. Um, but – Yes, so that so that's one thing. But I mean, to what to what extent can can us talking about things actually help? I mean, for people who have platforms, you know, the the debates generally aren't to change the other person's minds. Yeah. They're there to change potential audience members' mind, you know. Mm -hmm. Um but mm -hmm. like what can we do? I mean, yeah, we it, when we do engage in the conversations, we could all um, be a little bit more 
conscientious and because all this stuff is so, you know, high intensity, like, you know, people, emotions run high with this sort of stuff. Um, and so like, I have the, the kind of advice that I gen generally give is for people to like, try to use the Socratic method as much as possible and frame things in terms of questions rather than, you know, at attacks and statements, uh, in, in how you disagree with things. Uh, that's one thing. And to also, whenever you have those points of mutual agreement with someone you you're disagreeing with to really emphasize them and, and say them out loud and be like, yes, okay, cool. You know, here is a, I totally agree with you on this. So you can build some sort of common ground Yeah. in terms of outside of like ordinary discourse and conversations though. I really like the idea of um, a kind of like, I actually don't know the term for this. It's like gonzo journalism, right? But on the internet. So like the sort of thing that I try to do is, you know, I, I try to be like, especially if, if you saw the Chris Rufo piece on my sub stack where I just go deep into the parts of his articles that none of his fans go to the, uh, you know, the whistleblower documents that he's always referencing. And he, and I show that, you know, without fail, he's either exaggerating or, or misrepresenting what is being said in those whistleblower documents. But because he presents them in this article in city journal, and then if you want the whistleblower documents, you got to go an extra step to go to his homepage. Then you got to scroll all the way down and then you got to read them. It's like, well, you know, he linked them. So that's enough for me to trust that he's telling the truth here. He's not misrepresenting <laughs> him. Why would he misrepresent them if I could go look and see them myself? Yeah. And then everybody <laughs> thinks that way. And then everybody gets duped. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like more people exposing bullshit as bullshit, I think could potentially help. But, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I think within that confirmation bias is so strong, mm -hmm. right? Like people yeah. are, they already have their beliefs and really it's just about confirming them with the right kind of mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think that first point that you made was so crucial, right? Like let's just stop with all the jargon and the terms. And if we get to the specifics of what we really believe, I have no doubt that at least in most conversations, especially with people who aren't really engaged with the depth of the topics and who quite frankly, aren't really, they don't really care about it would probably come to realize that they share like 90% of like the same kind of attitude or like, can at least like see what another person's point is and be like, okay, that's fair. I, I feel like without a doubt, people would see how much common ground they actually have. Um, but instead it's just, you know, the terms kind of like exacerbate the the dialogue where it's just yeah. so charged, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I guess one more thing I would say is for people who, if you don't think that America is fundamentally racist, right? Especially if that's one of the things that's very offensive to you. With these are, this is one of the things that's basically banned in every single one of the anti-race uh, <laughs> talk uh, bills is the teacher can't, you know, tell the students that the state or the, the nation is fundamentally or intrinsically racist. Um, well, I encourage you to read more history about the United States because there's so much at least in my experience, that I did not know about just how deep our racist roots go and how every time it seems like we're making racial progress in this country, a couple years later, shit comes tumbling down and tumbling down hard and there's a backlash and resentment and uh, and division and, and hatred and, and violence and murder and all sorts of just horrific things like go go read more about 
go read what Martin Luther King Jr. actually said. He was not colorblind and he never advocated for colorblindness. That is a sentence taken out of context of a speech. Mm-hmm. There's, it's, it's, it's actually startling to me how many people don't know that because, you know, that's, it's, it's a sort of like American, just, just a, a, a saying a, that, that every American knows is the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. Yeah. And at that, and that you're taught that, oh, Martin Luther King he taught us this and 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 ever since then we've been not racist but no you know if if you read his last book which is actually the title Bryant you said earlier when we got into this is called where do we go from here mm-hmm. and he says that look yes we want the goal is equal treatment we want a society where one's race does not influence whether one is treated respectfully or disrespectfully. That's the ultimate goal. But given the history of the treatment of African Americans in this country, right? Now that things are sort of equal on paper in the sense that they can't be discriminated against legally, uh, overtly, that doesn't mean that the injustice has been righted. You know, you just... You, you haven't you haven't tried to heal the wound at all, right? You just took the knife out of the back. The wound is still there. That's Malcolm X. But um, but like, and, and and he says explicitly, you know, African Americans in this country, they need their due, right? Justice is giving a person their due, what they are owed. But sometimes. Giving someone what they're owed requires treating them specially, requires, requires, you know, partial treatment, special treatment. And that's the case when you have hundreds of years of, of exploitation, violence, slavery, second class citizenship. So there needs to be some form of reparations. We need racist, race consciousness in order to get to a place where we're at a state of racial equality that's sufficient to where we can finally say, okay, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's move on from, from this way of categorizing each other because, because we've, you know, we, we have finally reached a, a decent enough level of racial equality, but which if I'm being honest, I have doubts that we'll ever get there. Yeah. That's a tough mm. one. Yeah, that you know, it sounds like the you know the the issues with like reparations in general, right? Like Bernie Sanders, he said he's not for mm-hmm. reparations, mm-hmm. right? And, um, <clears throat> and I think that's the the issue is like the question is asked, like how do we even mm-hmm. discern who ought to get them? And I guess the that answer has always seemed a bit obvious, right? It's like you know, look at the conditions where you know, people are living in, look at what histories they've engaged with, right? Like after World War II, the GI Bill, right? A lot of Mm -hmm. African-American soldiers never got to reap the benefits that a lot of white soldiers did. And, you know, that loops into intergenerational wealth. And then you have slavery, which, you know, was, you know, even longer ago, but that still has an impact. And, you know, I think people, when they hear the word reparations, that just means, okay, I guess, you know, all African-Americans just get a fat check and people feel like that's not fair. And that's, (laughs) um, but yeah, it just seems like, you know, the people are turned off by this idea that no one necessarily said, Mm -hmm. but the idea that it conjures up. And then that is where, like, it's like the thing that you said earlier, Sam, about like making assumptions in your relationship, you know, like, I think we're making assumptions all the time yeah. and mm-hmm. it's like the assumption and the story that we have in our head is the one that we're reacting yes, off of yes. and not the humans that are opposite wow, us. Way to bring it full circle. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. I appreciate you. Yeah. Talking with us. This has been, yeah, it, it went a lot longer than I expected. Yeah. It's an hour 40, but thank you so no, much. Man, it's been, it's been a pleasure. I feel like I've fucking 
talked you guys' ears off. No, it's good though. Because <laughs> I wasn't Too aware much coffee. Of what happened in the, in the first video in your background. So thanks for mm. for doing it. No, man, it's it's fun and, and let's do it again sometime. You know, whether on or <laughs> yeah. off air. <laughs>